Yeah, I just want to start, I know a lot of us are hearing the uh, reports out of Syria and Turkey and how just devastatingly awful it is there. I um, just wanted to ask for a moment of silence and remind you that the you know, Rotary International Club is international. Even though uh, you know, we have a local branch here, uh, oftentimes the local branches, which you're going to hear more about today, will raise money for international and get it matched by the national foundation. So uh, I'm mentioning this because they will be doing a fundraiser for uh, the folks, the victims of the earthquake. And uh, I just ask that you keep an eye out for your email. We'll forward the link to all of you. And if you have any interest in uh, helping them out uh, and, and cooperating with the local Rotary Club, uh, then that would be very nice. So let's have a moment of silence. Thank you very much. Thank you. So good afternoon. I'm Chris Cooney. It's my pleasure to welcome you here to another edition of Good Day Metro South. Uh, it is so nice to be here at Tony Lee Golf Club. Uh, even though it's not sunny, uh, and so we know that brighter days ahead, and the golf course is going to uh, support a lot of fun activities in, in the uh, months ahead. I do want to mention Rich Campbell and Sharon Guthrie. They are the ones that work here that help us facilitate. As many of you know, the Chamber holds these programs regularly. It's a terrific opportunity to come together, reconnect with others, and to learn from interesting leaders and speakers on various topics. Uh, today, we are very pleased to be hosting Dr. Mayor uh, Bob Sullivan, as well as Dr. Mark Melnick of the University of Massachusetts. I would. Uh, I'd like to point out the dots on your name badges. Some of you might be wondering what that means. And it means that it's an invitation to introduce yourself to someone before you leave today with the same color dot. These dots have been introduced as diverse opportunities to share uh, information from yourself. You can either do it over lunch or dinner, or you can do it before you leave lunch, or do it before you leave today uh, and just have a chance to say hello to somebody. It's an open invitation. If you don't want to participate, take the dot off. <laughs> All right, there are Q&A sheets on each of your tables. Uh, they're green. If you have a question, as time allows, for the mayor uh, or Dr. Melnick, then uh, we ask you to jot that down, hold it up, and uh, a chamber ambassador or a staff member will uh, take those from you, and we'll try to feed in as many as possible. Again, time permitting. And then uh, finally, uh, Leadership Metro South is a new initiative uh, that is being introduced to this region. Many of you may have heard of Leadership South Shore, which has been in existence for five or six years uh, and has been very successful in creating an alumni group of over 100 people who get together, uh, the, the cohorts form uh, in the spring, and then uh, this one will, uh, in the Metro South region, will uh, kick off in September. And the idea is that five, six, seven months, uh, over a period of time, you'll visit different sites Uh, you'll have a chance uh, to really get to know the community and become more of a leader and more knowledgeable in your area. So uh, we've, we're doing this in cooperation, as the South Shore Chamber has done with South Shore Bank. We're doing it in cooperation with the South Shore uh, Bank. And I know there's a couple of representatives here. Uh, Joanne Tully, who runs the program. Raise your hand, Joanne, please, over there. If you're interested in the application, uh, say hello to her. I don't know what color dot you are, but it doesn't matter. Just go say hello to her. Uh, and uh, she will help you. Uh, that, that, and then we also have Jim Dunphy, the president of South Shore uh, Leadership Program, who also was a graduate of a program like this up in New Hampshire and thought so much of it he, he, he developed it down this area. So I know they've been uh, fine-tuning it and, and making it great. So we're uh, taking our first foray into this, and we hope that you will uh, either participate and apply or recommend someone who will do so because we think it'll be a great uh, program. We're going to kick that program off uh, April 12th uh, here in Brockton because the cohort that's already in is coming to Brockton for the day uh, to listen to an economic development panel but also tour two sites uh, in the city uh, to learn more about some of the industry uh, and challenges and whatnot in the city of Brockton. So uh, if you're interested in that, let us know. Again, you can see Catherine or Emma. It is now my pleasure to introduce our MC for today. Please join me in a warm welcome for Fred Clark, our former chair of the board and president of Bridgewater State University. Mr. Questions. Uh, 
All right. Thank you very much, Chris, and good afternoon, everyone. It's really great to be here. I want to start by thanking our Chamber Ambassadors who are in attendance today. Just stand up when I call your name. Brenda Karens, Oak Colony Elder Services, Catherine Light, Envision Bank, Suzanne Fernandez, Northeastern Savings Bank, Mary Ellen Baker, HR Alternatives, Mary Jane Anine, Combined Insurance, and Marcy Venezia, Above the Clouds. Just stand up and thank you very much, Chamber Ambassadors. We have a few chamber board members also in attendance today. Just uh, stand up quickly and be recognized. Sue Joss, Brockton Neighborhood Health Center. Yes. Carol Chin, McDonald's franchisee. And Doug Smith, Stonehill College. Bridgewater State graduate, sorry, I had to add that. All right. And finally, I want to thank our elected officials um, and state officials for their attendance today. There's a few that are here. Eric Beckerman, Town of Avon. Susan DeCastro, Brockton City Council. Shirley Azak, Brockton City Council. And of course, one of our star speakers today, our friend, Mayor Robert Sullivan, City of Brockton. Right. Today's Good, uh, Good Day Metro South program is being sponsored by Old Colony Elder Services, OCES. The mission of Old Colony Elder Services is to support the independence and dignity of older adults and individuals with disabilities by providing essential information and services that promote healthy and safe living. OCES provides, uh, proudly serves Greater Plymouth County and surrounding communities. OCES is a private, nonprofit organization which is headquartered in Brockton and is designated as one of 25 aging services access points in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. OCES is governed by a board of directors which includes representatives of the 23 communities in their service area. Since 1974, OCES has been the largest provider of in-home and community-based services for older adults and people living with disabilities in this entire part of Massachusetts. So thank you, OCES. And at this time, we, I get to invite our interviewer, our very talented and expert interviewer uh, for today's program, Sue Joss. CEO of Brockton Neighborhood Health Center to come forward. Thank you, Sue. And of course, Sue has to interview somebody, so we're gonna have two people come up here and I'm gonna uh, just introduce them and ask them to come forward. Um, so from OCES, representatives Dina Andrade and Nicole Long. Why don't you come forward? How are you, you ready for some tough questions? All right. Well, let me just uh, tell you, Ms. Andrade is a licensed independent social worker and behavioral health manager for OCES. Ms. Andrade's been with the agency for 10 years. She oversees behavioral health services and the new elder mental health outreach team. I'm gonna read this part slowly. Ms. Andrade holds a Bachelor of Social Work degree from Bridgewater State University <laughs> and a Master of Social Work degree from the University of New England. She provides clinical consultations as a member of the Greater Brockton Hoarding Resources Network. She chairs OCES's Ethics Committee and is a field supervisor to Master of Social Work students. Her personal and professional philosophy stands on a premise and belief that we are all people first. I love that. So Nicole Long has began, why don't you raise your hand, Nicole, so everybody knows who we're talking about here, began her career at OCES in 2005 she holds a Master of Social Work from, I'm gonna read this again slowly, Bridgewater <laughs> State University and is a licensed independent clinical social worker. She serves as a commissioner on the board of directors for the Plymouth Housing Authority, is a member of the Plymouth Select Board Senior Task Force, and is an equine facilitated psychotherapist at Wild Hearts Therapeutic Equestrian Program in West Bridgewater. Her primary focus at OCES is to maintain and grow both community and funding relationships. Most recently, OCES received the COVID-19 Hero Award from Community Services of Greater Brockton, a region where OCES has expanded housing programs to cover four new housing sites. And here we go, Sue. Thank you.
Welcome, Nicole and Dina. Great to have you. And you, you guys do awesome work in I could use some equine therapy. That sounds cool. <laughs> um, can you tell us briefly what OCS does and um, as a nonprofit, um, how you benefit the community? Yes, absolutely. Can everybody hear me okay? No? All right. How about how about now? How about I'll take this one? <laughs> <laughs> With all the microphone options. Uh, so uh, OCS, we provide a variety of services. I think most of you are really familiar with the in-home supportive services that we offer. Personal care, homemaking, grocery shopping, laundry, and things of that nature, as well as our Meals on Wheels program. But we do a lot more than that. We also work to provide family caregiver support, protective services, and we offer a variety of health and wellness and uh, evidence-based programs to individuals. But also we partner with a lot of our local community partners and colleagues to offer presentations at places of work for lunch and learn. And we're really happy because we now are able to offer a, vari a variety of behavioral health services to individuals in their homes. That's such a valuable service, so thank you for doing that. So statistically, we know that nearly half of adults um, with mental health conditions in the United States um, go without any treatment. Um, and people who seek tra treatment face a na have to navigate a fragmented, costly system that's full of obstacles. Um, and as a result, many people just don't access and can't access mental health care when they need it most. Can you talk about how OCS has expanded its services to help address barriers locally? Yes, absolutely. One other statistic, according to the 2018 Tufts Community Health Profile, just for the city of Rockton alone, 33% of individuals 65 and older suffer from some form of depression. And that was before COVID. So I think we can all agree, after going through COVID, the amount of individuals who are further isolated or newly experiencing symptoms has dramatically increased. Uh, our staff were just dealing with more and more challenging uh, circumstances. People were refusing services, even though they desperately needed them. Uh, just a lot of challenges and barriers. And even for the, the colleagues that we work with, you know, all of our services, behavioral health especially, I think we've all become saturated. There's not enough help to meet the need. There's long wait lists. And so we really started to think about what we could do. So we offer a variety of consultation services to our staff who don't have license, uh, so license in social work or who don't have clinical background. We also work with a lot of our colleagues to just express different ways they could work around some of the obstacles that they were dealing with. We did a lot of this with the local councils on aging. But then we, we knew we wanted to do more. Uh, and we applied for a grant through the Mass Councils on Aging, which is actually funded through the Executive Office of Elder Affairs. And we're really proud to announce that we received an Elder Mental Health Outreach Team grant, which allows us to go in the homes of people who are isolated. I certainly don't want to steal the thunder from Dina <laughs> because she's been working really hard to develop this program, so I'll pass it over to her. Okay, oh, that's awesome. And um, Dina, can you just give us more details about that program, the Enhanced uh, Mental Health Outreach? Sure. Oh, nope, not working. <laughs> Thank you. The Elder Mental Health Outreach Team, which may be often referred to as MHOT, aims to support older adults um, 60 years of age or older with complex behavioral health conditions, possible substance misuse, chronic illnesses, or those who may need support to help alleviate an imminent situation, or those who may need assistance um, due to gaps in services. And um, for example, a long wait list for counseling services um, and other long-term services. These services are provided, like Nicole said, um, in the consumer's home. And additionally, MHOT aims to build strong and supportive communities, prevent costly behavioral health problems, and minimize the gaps in service, and promote better health for the older adult population, including those who are isolated, um, have few informal supports, or may experience cultural and uh, linguistic barriers in obtaining 
needed assistance in the in the home. That's great. That's such an important need in our community for sure. So it's awesome that you got that grant. Um, so you've got a room full of chamber members and Rotarians here. Um, what can we do as, to help the work that you're doing? Such a great question. Um, MHOT is a community program, and it's really important for all of us um, to become familiar with the programs that are available in the community. And you, your employees, um, you might be caregivers yourself. You might have employees that are older adults. Uh, there might be individuals that come into your business establishments that might need that extra support in the community. And also, um, you can use it as a supplement to your EAP program. I just want to add to that the great thing about this program is it's it's a great way to work together. Mm -hmm. So you know whether you're Brockton Neighborhood Health Center or BMZ, you know if you have somebody that needs you know help sooner than later and they're on a wait list, you know we can provide temporary assistance and then hand it off when their name comes up on the list. And I think that's one of the great great parts of this program and that we can sort of. I think we've all experienced, we've made, we've made a referral, we know the person needs help, but the individual might not be ready yet. And we can help work with that person to get them ready to, to actually go to the appointment, mm -hmm. um, see their professional, and, and take things further. Well, thanks so much. Thanks for coming, and thanks for all the amazing work that you're doing, um, especially with our elders. We really appreciate it. And a little token of our appreciation, we have a chamber pen. Thank you. And thank you for all you're doing. Thank you. All right, they were terrific. Now I want to introduce our host partner for this Good Day Metro South program, the Rotary Club of Brockton. Do you want me to wait for a minute? Yeah, I don't want you to miss anything. This day, this time, this location is where Rotary Club meets regularly. Rotary is a global network of 1.4 million neighbors, friends, leaders, and problem solvers who see a world where people unite to take action to create lasting change across the globe, in our communities, and in ourselves. I want to just point out from my own experience, I've installed water filters provided by Rotary International in Cambodia Thousands of times those water filters have been installed to save the lives of children. Well done, Rotary. <laughs> Solving real problems takes real commitment and vision. For more than 110 years, Rotarians have used their passion, energy, and intelligence to take action on sustainable projects. From literacy and peace, as I mentioned, to water and health, Rotarians are always working to better the world. Now I would like to ask our partner representative from the Rotary Club to come up to be interviewed. Please welcome the president of the Rotary Club of Brockton, Tina White. Tina, great to see you again. I should mention I was Rotarian for more than 20 years. So it's great to see some faces and some of you that I haven't seen in years. Um, could you talk to us a little bit about um, the Rotary, including um, your role, present, future? Sure. Okay. Um, Fred kind of stole a little bit of my thunder, so <laughs> no, that's okay. That will make my job a little bit easier. So the Brockton Rotary Club um, was established in 1918. So this is our 105th year anniversary. Um, this month, actually. So um, kudos to us. Um, we've been around for a little while. one of the older clubs in our district. There are 65 clubs in our district, and um, as already mentioned, that is a 1.4 million um, members worldwide. Um, and uh, it's a great organization to be part of. I joined about 15 years ago, and um, quickly jumped on committees and was on the board. I've pretty much been every position on our board. Um, things lined up with my work life and home life, so I put my name in to be president. Um, here I am. Um, our, our president terms are for one year, so um, July to June. So 
In June, I will slide out, and um, I'm actually taking a position in our district. I will be an assistant district governor. That's a three-year term. And our incoming president, in um, I don't believe he's here unless I missed him, is um, Jeff Charnell from Northeastern Savings Bank. Oh, he is here. <laughs> I missed him. Um, so he will be taking over July 1st, and I am excited for that. <laughs> Great, thanks. Um, can you talk about a few reasons why people might join a Rotary Club? Absolutely. Um, so the most, I think, the one reason a lot of people join is um, they're invited to a meeting. And um, in, in my case, I said no multiple times, and then I finally caved, and I'm glad that I did. Um, a lot of people join because they want to be part of the community. Um, we are a service organization. It is an organized um, effort to do community service. Uh, we do a lot of projects in the city. We also partner with other clubs um, in our area, and we also work internationally. Um, and I'm actually seeing Margaret here, who I was going to talk about her program, actually. Um, our international program this year is to sponsor a child um, from Thailand, and that has been put on um, by the Quincy Rotary Club, and Margaret um, has came and talked to our club about it. Um, but we also do a lot of things in the community. I'm sure you've seen us, or you've heard of us, or if you're on social media, you've seen a blurb about us. Um, I think that really is the heart of our club. I think when you come, you join the fellowship and you enjoy that part of the club, and it's networking. As much as it used to not be networking or frowned upon, it is networking. You get to be with other people in the, in the community, other businesses, meet people, and then fellowship. You know, I've been in the club for 15 years, and I've made some great friends. Um, got myself changed my career a little bit <laughs> because of Rotary. Um, it's, it's a great um, club to be part of, great organization. That's great, thanks. Um, and can you talk about the Rotary Club motto and what it means to Rotarians and to the community? Definitely, yes. Okay, so the Rotary Club motto is service above self. And I think that means something different to everybody, but the it really comes down to providing a service or doing a project or helping an, another organization and not expecting anything in return. You may help install water filters across the globe and you're not really gonna benefit that. Um, what you get is more you know, benefit from the heart, I suppose, um, helping a, you know, a child in Thailand. Um, but even just packing food for the charity guild. You know, um, we do so many different things in the community. A lot of times you don't even know that we're there. Um, we've, we've partnered with so many organizations. Someone wanna, once asked me, like, you know, have you worked with this organization or that organization? I feel like the list of who we haven't worked with is probably, you know, really small compared to who we have worked with. And um, I think service above self is what we all, I know at least for Rotarians, we all try to do. Something that is gonna benefit someone else, somewhere else that we may not even get to know or be part of. That's amazing work that you're doing. And can you talk about the time commitment for members um, as well as the cost to be a Rotarian? Sure. Okay, so um, we, as with many organizations, had to make a change during COVID. So we used to meet weekly. We now meet the second and fourth Thursdays of every month, um, unless there's a holiday. And um, we primarily are a, a lunchtime club. Like um, you had mentioned, you know, this is our day, our time. Um, we are working towards offering more um, meeting availability. We're doing a, a morning month, uh, I can't talk, a morning meeting in March. That's a lot. <laughs> um, and we're gonna try that out. Um, we also have a lot of committees. Um, we have utilized Zoom, like so many have. We do a lot of our, our committee meetings on Zoom. Uh, of course, we do all our community service um, in person, and then we have our board meetings. I would say the average person who comes in, you know, you come to, to our, our regular meetings twice a month. The cost is the meals, and we do have a dues that we have to pay to our um, district and to Rotary International, and that is $200 a year. So plus your, your lunch fees, um, we do have fundraisers that are optional. You know, we do give to Rotary International. Chris had mentioned um, the earthquake in Turkey is something um, that we will, as Rotarians, have the opportunity to donate towards the effort for that. They've been donating towards the effort for Ukraine. Those are all, uh, you know, extra additional things. It's not required. Um, your, your attendance is not required, but we obviously want to see you. If you're a Rotarian, we want to see you. We want you to come and, and join when you can. We're all working individuals. We have different family lives. You know, um, the big commitment is just being there when you can for the things that you can, can 
fit into your schedule. There's a lot of different avenues in our club, so there's always something for someone, for anyone, at some point. Well, thank you for all you and all the Rotarians in the room do for our community. It's, it's really a, a, a great service that you're providing. Um, here's our token pen, and thank you for coming and being with us. to know who in the room are Rotarians. Raise your hand. Congratulations. Well done. So thank you very much, Tina, Dina, Nicole, Sue. We are very pleased now to welcome City of Brockton Mayor Robert F. Sullivan. But not yet, Mr. Mayor. Oh. <laughs> mayor Sullivan was born and raised in Brockton. He's the son of Robert and Susan Sullivan. Robert is a graduate of Bridgewater State University. I just had to add that. <laughs> he grew up on Wellington Street in Ward 2. He attended Brockton Public Schools, graduated from Brockton High School in 1988, earned his BA and MBA at Boston College, and his JD at the New England School of Law. Prior to being elected mayor for a second term, he served on the Brockton City Council, and in that role, he was elected by his colleagues to serve as the City Council President five times. He previously served as a volunteer board member of the Good Samaritan Medical Center, the St. Joseph Manor Nursing Home, and the Brockton Historical Society. He is a volunteer youth soccer, baseball, and basketball coach within the city of Brockton. He's a member of Our Lady of Lord's Church and is married to St. Maria <laughs> Sullivan. I think I added that piece. <laughs> who also grew up in Brockton, and they have three children. I want to just say, because the mayor and I, Troy Clarkson, Sidney Marrow, all had the pleasure of being in Cape Verde for a week together, and I didn't know the mayor as well as I did at the end of that trip. And let me just say, not only was my phone fully charged whenever it was in his presence, because he's got so much energy, but I can say, as a son of Brockton myself, the city of Brockton is in very good hands. Ladies and gentlemen, Mayor Sullivan. Well, good afternoon, everybody. First of all, I want to thank you uh, if you serve on the Rotary. Uh, how about if you're a member of the Chamber of Commerce? Raise your hand. I want to thank you. I want to thank you all. Uh, as Fred said, I'm, I'm Bob Sullivan. Uh, again, I'm just Bob from Brockton, and my title happens to be Mayor of the Fine City of Champions. Before I go into uh, some of my thoughts today, I just wanted to uh, give each and every one of you an update. As you know, we had a, a historic event that happened here in the city of Brockton the other day. The history of Brockton Fire Department, we never had a 10 alarm fire. It happened two mornings ago uh, at Brockton Hospital Signature Healthcare. And I want to just say how proud I was to be on site, led by Fire Chief Brian Naldelli, a product of Brockton Public Schools and a Brocktonian himself. We had 11 different fire chiefs from different municipalities here. Uh, we had over 85 ambulances here. We had apparatus from uh, Orleans on the Cape and Boston and Brookline. At the end of the day, not one injury, not one single injury. That was a catastrophic fire over there, and thank God that we have the brave men and women that serve and protect every day. Because it, I, uh, I, also, uh, I also have to, uh, I have to thank the men and women uh, that work at the Brockton Hospital. It must have been just extremely frightening and scary to be doing that. We actually had two women in active labor at the time. Over 165 patients were evacuated. Uh, Cape Cod Hospital, Falmouth Hospital, of course, I have good friends at Good Samaritan Medical Center here, South Shore, a lot of the hospitals in Boston, Morton, uh, the BI down in Plymouth. I mean, there was a lot of collaboration. And since I've been mayor of Brockton, that's been my whole mantra, right? We are better together. We, if we work together, we will achieve great, great, great things. And that, that's, uh, that's, thank you. That is, uh, that's also evident of uh, the leadership of Chris Cooney and his team at the Chamber. You know, a lot of people um, understand that it's a very difficult job to try to open a business or maintain a business uh, during a, a worldwide pandemic that hadn't hit us in 100 years. But through the guidance and support of the Chamber, we've seen a lot of new businesses here in the city of Brockton and not just Brockton, beyond. It's Metro South Chamber of Commerce. So I want to thank you, Chris, for your leadership and your team's leadership. I want to thank uh, Fred Clark. Uh, Fred is just, uh, he said my wife is, is St. Marie. I call him St. Fred. <laughs> the guy will do anything for anybody. Literally, he will do anything for anybody. Uh, he is uh, the pinnacle 
of leadership at Bridgewater State University, but he's just a great guy. So I want to thank you, Fred, for your friendship and your support. Thank you. Thank you. We're here today to, to talk about uh, the city of Brockton. And I am so excited to have three of my team members here. Troy Clarkson, the city CFO. John Messia, who's my director of constituent services and outreach and community engagement. And the newest member that started last week, Suzanne McCormick, my communications director. I want to thank you for what you all three do each and every day to better Brockton. So, so each and every one of you should be applauded because each and every one of you understand the importance of business in Brockton. Right? My whole goal is to attract businesses and maintain businesses here. And to do that, you have to treat the city of Brockton as a business. I just happen to be in the people business, right? But it's a half a billion dollar a year business. And thanks to the collaboration with the city councilors and the state delegation, we are achieving historic once in a lifetime opportunity here. It's a renaissance going on in the city of Brockton right now. A lot of people don't believe that, but it's true. And I will also tell you that the Baker Polito administration was fantastic, and now the Healy Driscoll administration has been fantastic. I also want to let you know the governor, lieutenant governor, uh, Attorney General Campbell, uh, U.S. Senator Ed Markey, U.S. Senator Warren, and Congressman Lynch all called me during that fire. These people care about Brockton, right? So, you know, we can talk about politics and Democrats and Republicans and this and that. At the end of the day, it's helping people. We are in the people business, public service. And it's, a, it's really a special talent to be able to see each and every one of you today. It doesn't matter if you lead a university or you lead a hospital or you lead a city, right? We're doing it for the right reasons at the right time. And as mayor, I just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you to each and every one of you. Because during trying times, that's when we're challenged the most, right? We talk about Brock to being the city of champions. You're the champions, right? We get kicked down, we get knocked down, but we get back up, right? You dust yourself off. It's the way my mom and dad taught me growing up in Brockton. And so at the end of the day, we need to continue to have the eyes on the prize. What's the focus? Focus right now is continuing businesses. There's a lot of developers here today. I know Joffrey Anatol's here. I, I know Rob Coley from NeighborWorks Housing Solutions, Joe Gonzalez, uh, Ted Carmen, Jerry Cavanaugh's a guy, you're gonna hear his name. He bought the Marion property. It's gonna be a game changer downtown in the city of Brockton as well. But we talk about marketing. Uh, there is a new marketing. It's called Where Better Begins. Right? Where Betty begins, it's here in Brockton, Massachusetts. And so I want to thank Chris Cooney for his collaborative efforts. I want to thank Bob Rivers, uh, who leads Eastern Bank, Eastern Bank Foundation. He's a guy from Stoughton. Every Friday night he came to Brockton and used to walk around the Westgate Mall, is what he told me. But he did, he told me that. I was up there too. He's just a little older than me. You can tell him that. <laughs> but I think at the end of the day, what we need to do is we need to be able to continue to figure out, thinking outside the box, how do we market it? How do we market it? This is something I did. I, I, I read the Boston Business Journal, New England Journal of Real Estate, and the Bank and Tradesman. I just read those three periodicals. First time in the history of Brockton, Brockton Mass made the cover of the BBJ. Right Now that's something because that's read by people that are high net worth, investors uh, that are investing in Brockton, or looking to invest in Brockton. Two different guys came to me recently, billionaires from Forbes magazine. A guy named uh, Sam Slater from Newton. He owns a hockey team out in Seattle called the Kraken. Another guy named David Freeman down in Nashville. He owns a hockey team called the Predators. And they came to meet with me and Troy, and, and, and I said, how is Brockton even in on your radar? And how does that happen? And he said, both of them said, it's, it's on all our radars. And I said, really, Nashville and, and Newton? Yeah, because you guys are doing it right right now. You're the mayor that decided not to uh, pause construction during COVID, right? I said, you're damn right, because we, we couldn't. We couldn't. If we did, we're taking 10 steps in the wrong direction. So right now, I'm proud to say that uh, come spring and summertime, you'll see more cranes in the city of Brockton than ever, ever. We're using ARPA money of $34 million, or we already have it in the bank account from Congressman Lynch. Steve delivered it himself, Brings truck pulled up and everything. He's from Southeast, so you know. But I will tell you that uh, we have another $17.5 million in the queue coming our way as well from our friends in the county. You know, they have a $110 million tranche of, of ARPA money. So, you know, we're going to spend it wisely, but we're also going to get the bang, biggest bang for the buck here in Brockton. So, again, if you are thinking about expanding your business or coming to Brockton, I say come. I'll welcome you with open arms. I'm a pro-business type of mayor. We need to continue to attract business. It helps our tax base, right? It, it's helping us. We have every tool in the toolbox. If you need historic tax credits, come to us. If you need a tie or a tiff, come to us. Whatever you need, opportunity zones everywhere in the city of Brockton. So I ask you humbly to uh, don't give up on Brockton. Know that as mayor, I am investing time and resources. The Shaw Center is something people keep asking me about. We've already invested four million bucks. 
We got reimbursed 100% of the $4 million under the CARES Act. Um, we actually have to take it offline for another year, and I'll tell you why. I'm closing the Council on Aging. Don't get nervous. Don't get nervous. <laughs> I'm putting $6.2 million in a renovation over there at the Council on Aging downtown Brockton, so I'm going to move them respectfully for a year. They're going to be at the Shaw Center. So after that year, it comes, comes to a conclusion. We're going we're gonna to get that going again. That's going to be a conference center. It's a conference center that we need to do, and we're going to bring it back. I'm also working right now with my DCAM friends to acquire the old Massasoit Conference Center, the old Christos too. Uh, I think we should be able to have that on that side of the city as well. You know, you got to double down. That's what you do in business. Bill Callahan, you know that. You have to, right? You have to think outside the box, but you have to have a return on investment. You have to stack it as an investment perspective. I also just want to let you know that um, the Rocks, uh, we have a new gentleman. It's actually the third, Troy, the third billionaire we've met. Guy named uh, Brian Kahn, he lives in Orlando, Florida. He owns the Brockton Rocks. He, uh, he actually tried to buy Kohl's. And when I talked to him, he's a Harvard guy. He said, Jesus, where are you buying? What Kohl's? He said, the whole company. <laughs> I thought he was talking about the one over in Randolph. I said, no kidding, yeah, yeah. I asked him how Florida was. He says, come down and if you want to stay at my guest house. I said, what the heck's a guest house? So, uh, but no, I will tell you right now, if you're a baseball guy or if you're not a baseball guy or gal, if you're an entertainer or someone that likes to take kids, I have three kids, I take them to there all the time. Savannah Bananas is a big deal right now. They're coming to Brock and they're going to be here in August. We also have invested uh, high, uh, high amounts of money, 1.6 million in new LED lights over there. I just saw authorized another 700 grand to have a new scoreboard over there. It's going to be just, you know, glamour and pizzazz. But you need to do that, right? Little things matter, the broken window things, right? The, the, every little personal touch you need to do. I also want to let you know I authorized last week uh, new concession stands all throughout the Rocks uh, Stadium as well. The big thing that I want to tell you right now is that um, we as a community um, need to learn from the history, right, from our past, but forge ahead for the future. And so some little things we're doing right now, and I want to thank State Rep Cassidy. I want to thank all the reps, Michelle Dubois, our newest rep, uh, Rita Mendez, and Senator Mike Brady. Um, when I asked them to help us on a, on a state level, they don't hesitate, right? And so I asked them uh, to come up with some additional funds. I want to do a marvelous Marvin Hagler statue downtown Brockton. And we got 150 grand, thanks to Jerry Cassidy. So 28 Petronelli Way, where Marvin used to train, a guy named Ted Carmen, Concord Square, owns it. And he was having a little trouble because there was some delays. Of course, COVID's delayed everything in terms of supply chain, right? So I call our friends at Eversource, and, uh, and they're going to they're gonna fast track that. So that's going to happen soon. And they're going to have a little pocket park down there as well, across from the old mayor, uh, the late mayor, Bill Kopp, and his parking garage. But then they ran into a problem with National Grid because, again, delays, delays, delays. So I happened to be in an event with uh, Marty Walsh. Uh, soon to be uh, leading the NHL. But the Secretary of Labor and I have been friends for a long time, and Marty was speaking in Boston uh, two Fridays ago, and there was a CEO there from Baltimore who actually is the new CEO, a guy named Steve uh, Warner, who's the new CEO of National Grid. And if you know me, I'm pretty type A. Some people call me a little hyper at times, right? But I have, a, again, I have a, a lot of energy, as Fred said. And so I said, well, where is the guy? Oh, he's sitting in the back. I said, okay, he'll be sitting with me in a second. So he came to sit with me. And I said to him, listen, with all due respect, uh, I need you to have Brockton number one on your map right now. Baltimore's great, right? Camden Yards is great. It's not Fenway, but it's great. But I need you to help us today. I need you to come up with an ability to get a transformer so that this project in downtown Brockton is not delayed for six months or six years. I need you to consider this today. Please, respectfully, humbly, let's get this done. And if you need me to get in my car, I'll drive to Canada to pick the damn thing up. Let me know. <laughs> so he looked at me, Troy, you were there. He looked at me and he said, I like you. I like you. You're a little different and I don't really understand how you're talking the way you talk. And, <laughs> but guess what? He called me. He called me the next day and we have the transfer coming. It's en route. So these are the things you have to do to achieve, uh, achieve what we want. But I, I just want to leave you on this because I want to hear from Dr. Mark. But, um, you know, when we are talking about budgeting, uh, that's one of the most important jobs as, as, as mayor, right? You have to come up with a budget. And again, last year was $540 million. But this year, I, I've, I've already kind of laid the groundwork working with my colleagues on the city council. And again, I was there for 14 years, and I, I really, I like all of them. They're doing it for the right reasons. We need to have an Office of Immigration Services in the city of Brockton. Brockton has always been a city of immigrants. My grandparents came from Ireland and work in the shoe factories. So we need to have that. And it's not a service for 
Haitian folks or Cape Verdean folks or people from Ecuador or, or, or Guatemala. It's for Brocktonians that are coming here that need some guidance and assistance. And when Fred was nice enough to invite me and my team to Cape Verde, I, I had the opportunity, all of us had a, the opportunity to speak to uh, President Neves and his wife, the First Lady. And uh, I made that pledge. I made that pledge. We're going to do that in Brockton. And we also have to have two full-time grant writers in the city of Brockton. We don't have any grant writers in the city of Brockton. We have 106,000 people. We don't have grant writers. So, you know, you have to invest a little bit to get that return on investment. My last thing is this. Listen, I have my, my son Tommy's birthday is today. He's 16. Uh, my daughter Grace is 13, and, and my little guy Will's 10. And so, you know, I do coach. I'm a, the worst coach in the world, but I, you know what? When I'm, when I'm long gone, they're not going to care that I was married. They're going to care that I spent time with them as a dad. And uh, my father did that as well. Uh, but I can tell you that as a mayor, you have to do it the right way. And there's a lot of great mayors. Uh, but I'm my own self, my own person. But I don't hesitate to jump on a plane and go to Washington, D.C. Last April, I said, Troy, pack your bags, we're leaving tomorrow. And I don't know what Donna said, your wife, who is the newest First woman ever elected to Bonsville County as sheriff. We never ran for office again. Congratulations to you and your wife, sheriff. <laughs> but we, uh, we, 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 we jumped on a, on a plane to Logan. We got into Reagan, and we went to a hotel. And I called Steve Lynch. I said, Congressman, I'd love to come over to see you. I, I called Ed Mackey. I'd love to come see you, Senator. And Congressman Bill Keating. And people said, why did you meet with him? Well, Brockton owns some of Silver Lake area, and that's uh, Congressman Keating's area. And, I went down there and I said, listen, I, I just need your help. We have this opera money, which is historic, renaissance, once in a lifetime, but I need additional federal earmarks under President Joe Biden. I need federal earmarks to help Brockton. We have a pool on the east side of the city of Brockton for uh, many people, that's the beach. That's the beach in Brockton, right? They don't get to go over the bridge to the Cape. And as a young kid, I, I lifeguarded there, and I know how valuable that is, but it hasn't had any substantial investment since the 60s. And they said, well, what do you need, Mayor? And I said, I need about three million bucks over there. I don't want to take that from the opera money. I will if I have to, because it's that important. But I'd rather not. I'd rather supplement that money from some federal earmarks. And while we're at it, I'd love to get another two million bucks for the city of Brockton. Why the hell not? I'm here, right? I need two million bucks because we have uh, massive development going on in the city of Brockton. And it's not glamorous, and it's not sexy. It's called <laughs> waste. But we have waste in the city of Brockton. We sludge dry it right now, and we, we dry it, we ship it to Connecticut. We have to come up with a, a way, because I'm doing all this investment with all of you, two million bucks. And so I'm proud to say that that, that $200 flight to down there to JetBlue on that one night at that hotel, President Joseph Biden signed off $5 million coming back to Brockton. He signed that a couple weeks ago. So. So it's the little things that matter, and, and Jim Dumphy's here, and, and I, I want to say how sorry I am for the loss of your mom, Jim. I really am so sorry. My prayers and thoughts with you. Uh, Jim didn't know me from Adam. I gave a speech, a crazy speech at Massachusetts Community College, and again, you know, I like the Energizer Bunny, blah, blah, blah. And uh, he, I must have hit home for something. He called me, and I had lunch with him and a gentleman that was on his board, Mike Sheehan, who I didn't know, but Mike used to be a principal at uh, Hill Holiday with Jack Connors, BC guy. And Mike said, listen, you might want to go to Greenville, South Carolina. They're doing it right down there. Their downtown has been transformed. It's an old factory city, kind of like the city of Brockton. So Troy and Rob May and myself went down there. We met with the mayor. We met with the chamber down there. And, and you know what? It, it's an example. But we're going to do it better here in Brockton, I'll tell you that. But it's the little things that make a difference. It's the personal touch, but it's being able to articulate a plan and execute a plan. It's a mission statement. So I just wanted to come here today. I want to thank Chris for inviting me. I'd rather hear from Dr. Mark than a kid from Brockton. So listen, if any of you, and I mean this, I'll take the glasses off. I don't need the cheaters now. If any of you need anything from me, or my team, and I mean that, anything. It's an open door policy, right? There's some rumors, Sullivan's leaving, he's going to work for Healy and this and that, he's gonna be a judge. I'm running for re-election in the city of Brockton, just to let you know. This isn't political, but I just wanna let you know I am. But I, 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 I wanna to continue to uh, really have the synergy going forward. All of you have different skill sets, right? Uh, and you all have different um, professional acronyms that we need to harness, right? We need to work together. So I thank you, thank you, thank you for what you do. God bless each and every one of you. And let's keep going here in the City of Champions beyond. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, I'm exhausted after that comment, set of comments. <clears throat> We're going to hear from the mayor in a minute or two. We're going to have a little Q&A session. But as I said earlier, Brockton is clearly in good hands, so as the mayor just described. 
So thank you again, uh, Mayor Sullivan, and it's my pleasure now to introduce Dr. Mark Melnick, UMass Donahue Institute. Before you come up, Mark, let me just tell uh, the folks about you. Mark specializes in demographic, socioeconomic, and labor market issues, and leads a 20-person team working on a variety of economic and public policy research projects, which inform clients in government, private industry, and the nonprofit sectors. In his time at the Institute, Dr. Melnick has served as the principal in charge on projects with such clients as the Massachusetts Gaming Commission, Mass Development, Mass Department of Housing and Community Development, and last but not least, the Metro South Chamber of Commerce. In addition, Dr. Melnick serves as the Senior Managing Director of Mass Benchmarks, the Journal of the Massachusetts Economy, published by the Institute in cooperation with the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston. Before joining the Institute, Dr. Melnick worked as Deputy Director for Research at the Brock, a Boston Redevelopment Authority, where he led research teams on demographic and economic research studies, as well as analyses used for public policy advisement and decision making. It's very easy to just say all this. As a leading expert, really? Oh, well, Chris didn't get that memo. As a, I'm almost done. As a leading expert in demographic and socioeconomic issues in the Commonwealth, Dr. Melnick is quoted extensively in the media and was appointed by, sorry, to Governor Charlie Baker's Future of Transportation Commission and the Massachusetts Economic Development Council Board of Directors. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Dr. Mark Melnick. All right. Well, that's going to be a really tough act to follow. Um, <clears throat> so I'm Mark Melnick. I direct economic and public policy research at the Donahue Institute. I think they expected uh, the mayor's energy because when I got here, they're like, so how long are you going to talk for? Uh, so so I, I <laughs> and uh, unfortunately, I'm kind of the, the vegetables part of the, uh, of the show, so I do apologize. There's going to be a lot of nerd stuff here. Uh, but uh, Chris and uh, uh, crew can share this slide deck with you all. Um, uh, but our, at our work at the Donahue Institute, we um, one, we produce a, a journal called Mass Benchmarks, which is a, a, an applied economics journal on the Massachusetts economy. And we do all kinds of uh, uh, consulting research projects for different kinds of clients around the state. We've done a bunch of work with Chris. Uh, we're actually doing some work with uh, uh, with uh, Catholic Charities Brockton right now. Uh, and, and a broad array of folks. And for us, it's a, a lot of research that's a kind of a so what element about, around like what are some of the big trends that are happening in the world? And then, uh, and how, um, and how can people uh, impact them? Um, and then, at, as a result of the, all that research, I end up doing what we call the road show, where I go uh, do different talks at different places. Uh, I talked on Tuesday with the Worcester uh, Business Journal, for example, and talk about some of the things that we're seeing in Massachusetts. And so, I'm road testing a few new things for folks right now. Uh, I think that's a bit of a transition as I talk about the economy and. You know, we spent a bunch of time. Well, before the uh, uh, COVID, I, I was I joked early in 2020 that the roadshow is getting a little boring. I keep saying the same stuff all the time, so be careful what you wish for. Uh, spent the next two years, 2020 and 2021, really doing a lot of um, looking at what COVID had done to folks and who was most impacted. I feel like uh, we're really transitioning now to like what what is what is next? What is happening now? The economy, in a lot of ways, has recovered. Uh, to where it was pre-pandemic. Uh, the unemployment rate is remarkably low, uh, but there are these prevailing uh, headwinds right now, concerns around inflation and where the economy is going, uh, concerns about a recession. So with that, I'm gonna uh, hop into the conversation. For first thing here is uh, what we added new is uh, Massachusetts at a glance. And I'll end up touching on a bunch of these concepts throughout the conversation, but here uh, we have just some high level things about the state. Um, this, the first one, unemployment, is at 3.3%. If you would have told me two years ago that, uh, or when the uh, pandemic started, that unemployment was going to be historically low at the beginning of 2023, I would not have believed you. Uh, and a part of the reason was that it, the last recession that we experienced, the Great Recession, had a really sti had sticky elements to it in terms of really recovering jobs. This re this recession was quite different and was you know forced from the outside in a lot of ways. Um, but as a result, we've re we've uh, recovered jobs pretty quickly. Mass kind of fits right in the middle of the nation. Our unemployment rate is quite similar. The U6 U6 is an unemployment rate for those folks who are both unemployed or folks who are part time but would like to be full time. This is still this is a pretty low U6 unemployment rate. The more traditional one we look at is what we call U3, that 3.3. <clears throat> the state itself has been growing historically over the last few decades. 
Uh, population was up 7.5% between the 2010 and the 2020 census. In interestingly, the last two years, we've seen some slight population declines, and I'll touch on that in a minute. Job growth has been pretty uh, decent in the state, about 5% over the last year. And then a few other things I want to touch on real quick. Um, Ma Massachusetts has the se seventh highest foreign-born population in the country. Uh, immigration has been such an important part of the economic story in, in uh, Massachusetts for the last several decades. 80% of the labor force growth in Massachusetts since 1990 is due to growth in the foreign-born population. The city of Brockton is a third immigrant. So it's an important story as we think about our economy now and where our economy is going forward, especially with the aging of the baby boomers. 10% of Massachusetts is below the poverty rate, which is fairly low. And I'm going to touch on a few things inside of this. But uh, there is this kind of bifurcation in Massachusetts, though. Uh, we have uh, very high wages in a lot of industries, but then a lot of folks that are struggling. And struggling because we have high cost of living, particularly around housing. Median age, we are, uh, our median age is 40, which makes us one of the oldest states in the country. Boston Globe ran a brilliant uh, uh, idea section that came out today around shortages in labor in the future. The aging of the baby boomers is going to be a big part of the story I tell as we move forward. And we have the most well-educated population in the country. Nearly half of Massachusetts has a college degree now. And that really uh, informs much of the uh, knowledge-based industries and empowers a lot of knowledge-based industries in our state. This next graphic here uh, shows a comparison between Massachusetts in the red and the U.S. in the orange. Uh, the concentration of jobs by different industries. Uh, this will obviously be a little easier to consume when you, if you have your, the PowerPoint and it will be shared. But the thing I want to uh, call people's attention to in particular is our strengths in healthcare and social assistance, which is right here at the top. Actually, I talk pretty loud, so I'll, I'll walk away from this a few times. Educational services, where we have twice the proportion of jobs in, in education. And professional and technical services, 12% of our economy. Professional technical services includes things like scientific research, high tech, bio. It's a huge part of the Massachusetts economy and really stands out in relation to the rest of the uh, nation. This graphic I love showing because I like talking about um, the challenges for being low and moderate income in a high cost state. One of the things that gets masked sometimes in Massachusetts is the challenges for low and moderate income folks because of the mix of industries we have. This graphic here is per capita income in the United States. Massachusetts is the richest state in the country. That's what this graphic shows. The, the, the per capita income in Massachusetts is $82,000. Nationally, it's $63,000. Why I point this out is because of the high wage industries that we have, but we all know, and every person in this room, especially people working in social services knows, this is not the, the modal example for people who live here, right? So one of the things that, that I find very important in our work at the Donahue Institute, especially around issues of equity and inequality, is trying to shine a light on the fact that there are significant differences and stark differences and that these high line numbers, whether it's a 3.3% unemployment rate, a 10% poverty rate, or $82,000 a year as a uh, per capita income, doesn't tell the entire story. Uh, this next graphic uh, goes back to 1976 and shows the unemployment rate for the U.S. and for Massachusetts, with Massachusetts being the red and the U.S. being the orange. Uh, it's a lot of data in there. A couple things I want to mention. The uh, vertical gray bars that you see, those are recessions. The thickness of that gray bar is how long that recession took place. Um, interestingly, the COVID recession is the shortest recession ever, uh, which, which, which is really funny when you think about it because recessions are declared by the NBER. Um, so there's a bunch of nerds who sit around and they say, that looked like a recession. And it would ran from this point to this point. But people feel recessions differently in their own households. And so the COVID recession was like a month or two long. Uh, but the reality was the experiences for, for folks in their households stretched on quite a bit longer. Uh, the other thing I want to point out, though, is just the ways in which our economy has differed from the US over time. Not surprisingly, our unemployment rate and the nation's unemployment rate kind of move in tandem with one another. Um, we're a smaller part of a larger thing. Uh, but one of the ways in which we've really separated has been the changes in our economy since the beginning of the 2000s. Uh, and, you, and you can see here in the Great Recession, uh, this separation that occurs, 
Massachusetts' mix of industries, particularly our, our mix of industries and knowledge in the knowledge sector, really insulated the state from the negative impacts of the COVID recession. And as a result, we saw this separation between Mass and the U.S. And that continued on for much of the recovery period. When COVID hits, the, our unemployment rate spikes. And then in the northeastern part of the nation, we were uh, COVID hit here first. Uh, Massachusetts, New Jersey, New York, shutdowns were uh, more um, proactive. And as a result, we saw this, this dramatic shock in unemployment. But ever since then, it's come down pretty dramatically. And again, we're at 3.3%. The experiences of COVID, though, were, um, were uh, acute within particular communities. <clears throat> the last two recessions have been the two most unequal recessions on record, uh, and in part because the impacts have been negative, most negatively impact, uh, felt by folks in uh, low-wage, uh, service-based industries. The graphic on the left, these are both spaghetti, but I think the things that are most important to look at on the left is how unemployment has changed for, by race, and on the right, looking at it for education. Uh, let's look at the blue here on the, on the left, and we see the high unemployment rate for folks who are Hispanic. During the height of the COVID uh, downturn, 40% of uh, Hispanic folks in Massachusetts were unemployed. Uh, similarly, when we look at educational attainment, 25% of folks without a college degree were unemployed. Uh, we do see this, uh, this bounce back, but the way our economy has really uh, reshuffled itself has really led to significant negative impacts for folks uh, with limited educational attainment uh, in particular populations. Uh, this graphic here looks at changes in jobs uh, over the course of the uh, recovery period. Um, this is the, uh, the negative, uh, how many jobs have we were short, pr uh, oh, one more time. These are the number of jobs below the pre-pandemic peak uh, for each month dating back to the beginning of the recession. So uh, when uh, COVID first hit, we were down 700,000 jobs in Massachusetts. We're down now 12,000 jobs. So we're basically fully recovered, but we're not all the way there yet. Uh, how does that compare to other places in the country? Uh, the yellow, the brighter yellow is the U.S. and the red is Massachusetts. We're 99.9% .9 recovered from the beginning of the pandemic. That rates us 28th in the nation, so kind of in the middle. Uh, but it's a pretty big clump of right around 100% uh, states uh, and, and the U.S. is just a hair, hair above. I will say that um, the jobs report that just came out last week uh, showed the U.S. adding 500,000 jobs. Uh, the state data lags, uh, so I do anticipate the next time we get uh, numbers for employment for the state will actually be up over that number. This graphic here uh, looks at how changes have happened within different industries in the state and what recovery looks like. Um, uh, on the top of, with this barbell is the uh, industries that have fewer jobs now than they did pre-pandemic. Uh, so the red dot, when the red is to the right, you have less jobs. Um, and when the yellow is to the right, you have more jobs than you did pre-pandemic. So all the less jobs or fewer jobs are at the top. The most significant one is leisure and hospitality. We're about 50,000 jobs below our pre-pandemic peak in leisure and hospitality. And this was an industry, obviously, that was severely impacted um, by uh, the recession, but has also had some like downstream problems because of problems with immigration uh, and, and uh, inability to fill uh, current job vacancies. Uh, the other thing I wanted to, uh, other ones that are lagging, retail, other services, which is a terribly named industry, but it's basically personal care industries um, like nail, hair, auto repair. Uh, so things that had that face-to-face -face component to it, we still see this lag in job recovery. What I think is really important to point out, though, and I mentioned it earlier, was professional and business services. That's this bottom one right here. Before the pandemic, this is an industry that had 57,000 jobs in Massachusetts. Today, it has 97,000 jobs, so nearly doubles in three years. So it's a really important part of our economy, and it's been growing dramatically. Uh, that said, that's looking at a three-year um, uh, horizon. Uh, but what's been happening in the last year? Well, in the last year, job recovery looks a little bit different. Uh, this compares mass to the U.S. and a couple of the industries that I've been hitting on. And what I think is important, and uh, the mayor touched on this some already, construction uh, has grown 6% in Massachusetts over the last year compared to just 4% nationally. There's a lot of different parts of the state that is uh, um, boasting about uh, 
increased construction activity. I was in Worcester on Tuesday giving a similar talk uh, and, a, and a lot of the same kind of comments about Worc Worcester being open for business and a lot of exciting things happening in town there. Worcester's not the city of champions. It is not. It is not the city of champions. And I'm glad you mentioned this because I was going to say um, I, I like I, I love coming to Brockton uh, in part because I, I grew up in Youngstown, Ohio, which is like if you had Brockton in Ohio. So we like to think of ourselves as the city of champions because of Ray Boomer Mancini and, Kel uh, and Kelly Pavlik, but um, and then, uh, uh, which was the other one? Oh, leisure and hospitality grow almost 8% over, uh, over the last year. So we're seeing significant growth there, even though it's way behind where it was. Um, one of the things we were really interested in early in the Great Recession was the unevenness of recovery uh, that we saw as the economy came back, and in particular, how, uh, how intense job growth was in Boston and greater Boston relative to the other parts of the state. This graphic looks at what recovery looks like now in Massachusetts by different regions of the state. Unsurprisingly, Boston, in the Boston, Cambridge, Nash Nashua area uh, has recovered jobs the most uh, and is just a hint below where it was pre-pandemic. Springfield's doing all right, uh, Lemonster. Uh, but importantly, I, I draw attention to places like New Bedford and Pittsfield. Uh, these uh, MSAs are about five percentage points below where they were, uh, or uh, five percent below where they were pre-pandemic. Uh, something we're going to continue to track just to see, you know, how the evenness of job recovery going ahead. Um, one of the things we do at the um, uh, Donahue Institute is um, produce mass benchmarks, as I mentioned. Uh, we have a, a board of economists to get together and talk about the economy quarterly. We also release an index report on where we see the economy going uh, for the state. Uh, what's important is um, when people say, when, when's the recession coming? Is there going to be a recession coming? One of the technical ways a recession is defined is uh, two consecutive quarters with negative growth in GDP. Uh, we already had that. Um, now, the nerds haven't declared it a recession, and I don't know if they will, uh, because it was very strange to have negative uh, 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 GDP, uh, GDP growth while at the same time having a very tight labor market. Uh, the end of 2022 is actually a lot better for the economy than we anticipated, although we are projecting some slow growth in the early part of 2023, and part of this is uh, driven a little bit by some demographic things I want to touch on. Uh, everyone likes talking about inflation nowadays, and inflation in our region looks pretty similar to the nation, uh, in, and it's been coming down, as you can see with the curve here. Uh, this is when everyone's freaking out, of course, and over the last several months, we're seeing inflation coming down. Uh, Fed policy is certainly having an impact on what we're seeing with inflation, um, and particularly when it comes to housing prices. But strong jobs report also kind of, ironically enough, is a kind of a negative because you end up having wages going up at the same time as you're trying to cool the economy. What stands out around here uh, is our increased prices in utilities. Uh, year over year, fuel and utilities in greater Boston uh, they don't do it just for the state, but you can get uh, a greater uh, Boston region. Uh, uh, utility and fuels are up 36% compared to a year ago at this time. I live in Natick. We had a, um, uh, like, we buy into a community energy rate, and it changed. Uh, and they warned us that this was coming. And I get this electric bill in December, and it was like twice what it was for the months before. So we had a family meeting with the kids to be like, all right, now you really need to start turning off the lights when you come upstairs. Uh, but, but, that's, uh, but that's really unique to our area, in part because of the, uh, of the war in Ukraine really having a huge impact on this. Um, there was a lot of attention early in the pandemic uh, recovery around the Great Resignation, uh, which was an uh, incorrect way of describing it. It was really the great job change. Uh, what was happening was workers had a little more power to uh, jump to new opportunities when the economy opened back up into higher paying opportunities. So we were seeing wages increase. This graphic gets at this though. Uh, this bar here, this line here shows the hiring rate in Massachusetts, which has been, been about 3.3% right now. And the top shows the job opening rate. Uh, so we have job openings way, way up. Guys, look, folks looking for work, uh, looking for workers. Um, but this disconnect between the hiring and uh, the job openings, and that's the biggest disconnect as you kind of look at that, that, that trend line. So when employers are saying, I'm having a hard time finding people, this is what shows that. Same time as the quit rate. Um, this is the percentage of people who are leaving their jobs voluntarily. In Massachusetts, you can see the quit rate rise as the economy gets better. It's higher for the US than it is for Mass, and part of that's because of the mix of industries that are strengths for us. 
uh, because we have a lot of strong knowledge-based industries and the quit rates are lower there. Quit rates are highest in the low-wage industry, so retail, food services, these are places where we saw a lot of changes. All right, this is my favorite graphic that we do at the Donahue Institute. It tells virtually every story that you can t tell about Massachusetts all in like one picture. Um, here we're looking at the components of population change in Massachusetts dating back to 2000. Um, let me touch on a few uh, pieces here. The blue is birth, our birth rate, and the orange is our death rate. When I was doing this a year ago at this time, death actually was over birth and then there was a revision by the Census Bureau so it brought it back down. Um, what's important to highlight here is the conversion between birth and death. We're an aging state. Uh, we're an aging state that was living through a global pandemic. Birth, death went up, and despite uh, silly stories and memes on the internet, people did not have pandemic babies. Uh, the only people who probably could have were people who didn't already have children because my kids were all over us. Um, but, but, uh, but people generally don't have kids during, uh, during economic downturns. So we see these two things converging. Um, then uh, let's look at ele other elements of change. We have domestic migration here. Massachusetts has been a net loser in domestic migration for about a decade. Uh, but uh, the only time we haven't, uh, didn't see that was during the Great Recession. Domestic migration, somebody lives here and goes and moves to another state. We traditionally lose about 30,000 residents a year in Massachusetts of people moving to another state. Last year, 57,000. It's the most we've ever recorded. Now, one thing, uh, two things. We have a lot of churn in our state naturally just by nature of the characteristics of Massachusetts. A lot of college students, uh, so people kind of come and go a lot. The other thing, though, is that we have a lot of immigrants. And when an immigrant moves to Massachusetts and then goes to New Hampshire, now they're a domestic migrant. So there's a little bit of uh, noise inside that data, but it's an important story nonetheless because of these issues of cost and quality of life and what may be some push factors in a population. The, other, the next part is our international migration. I already said back, dating back to 1990, 80% of our labor force growth is due to the increases in our foreign-born uh, labor. Well, uh, immigrants are an important part of our story. I, I, I highlight, I talk about this as it relates to our economy. I also talk about it as it relates to our racial makeup. Massachusetts racial makeup and a lot of our gateway cities racial makeup have shifted dramatically over the last couple of decades because of the gains in uh, Latinx and Asian populations. Uh, but obviously during the pan, uh, early in the uh, uh, Trump administration, there were some changes to uh, uh, visa policies, but most importantly, as the pandemic amplifies, immigration goes down dramatically. So we end up with a, a net of less workers in Massachusetts than we had pre-pandemic. This is looking at the total number of workers in the state uh, dating back to 2018, uh, out to 2022. This is uh, when the pandemic happens, a bunch of people drop out of the labor market. These little blips you see here, this is the reopening of different things. So you can see labor force participation happen, changes as kids are back in school, and women in particular re-enter the labor market. But what ends up happening though, is that we kind of flattened out here. We're now just a little fewer uh, workers than we had pre-pandemic. So it isn't so much that people don't want to work, which was one of these things that stories that kind of got kicked around early in the pandemic. It's like people are being paid not to work. People, what was happening is that we just had fewer workers. And part of what was happening uh, was uh, increases in retirement. Uh, and this was a problem that we've been pointing to as labor market economists for a long, long time, it was the aging of the baby boomers and what was going to happen. So you freeze the world for two years, and a lot of crazy stuff happens. But one thing that definitely happened was we kept getting older. So then people move into these retirement ages, and we, and we uh, get into this issue of uh, challenges with labor supply in the future. These two graphics here, this shows the age pyramid in 2010 in Massachusetts. On the right is the, what we would call an age pyramid, but is an age rectangle uh, in 2050. These are population projections that we do at the Donahue Institute. We do them for every city and town in Massachusetts as part of our work for the Secretary of the Commonwealth. And we actually use this to uh, inform different public policy exercises we do, like school enrollment forecasts for different schools. We're working with MassDOT right now on using these to help uh, uh, inform funding uh, policies for how populations will move around in the state. But this is what we're seeing as a, a changing age profile. If you take the age profile I showed you in 2050 and apply today's labor force participation standards to that age population, here's what happens to labor force growth in Massachusetts. In the 30-year period between 1990 and 2022, 
the state's population goes up 13.5%. If you take that same age profile that I showed for 2050, use our labor force participation rates, today we end up with a labor force that grows by half as much, by less than 7%. And why? It's because of which populations work. Uh, this, uh, this graphic here shows labor force participation by different cohorts. Massachusetts has the some of the highest labor force participation in the country, 67%. The big reason is because we have a very well-educated population. If you went to college for all those years, you're pretty sure to go, <laughs> you're going to want to work, right? Um, and it's a high-cost place, so you need two uh, earners. Uh, but we see these change differences in labor force participation by ed education. 90% of folks with a college degree are working, 63% folks with less than high school. But as you move up the age profile, then labor force participation drops, right? So if you're between 25 and uh, 55, you're very likely to be working, it's about 85%. Once you reach 55 and over, labor force participation drops dramatically. So when your population starts concentrating in those age cohorts, you're at risk of having fewer workers. Now one might say, well, old folks, why don't you just work longer, okay? But we have the highest labor force participation for old, uh, older residents. We have the highest labor force participation for women. So it's a little bit tough for us to squeeze blood from those stones. Uh, so I think from a public policy perspective, it's being really thoughtful about identifying those populations with low labor force participation and trying to find ways to make working easier. I'm, I'm speaking in particular about folks with um, pre, uh, incarceration records, uh, folks with disabilities, uh, folks with limited educational attainment, and maybe working less often than, than other groups. So how to, how to better utilize underutilized labor. Um, housing costs, I do, I'll touch on this real quick. Um, it, the census has an interesting variable uh, measure called housing cost burden. It's when you're spending 30% or more of your income on housing. Uh, Massachusetts has uh, significant housing cost challenges. Our renters look similar to renters in the nation. 50% of renters in Massachusetts are housing cost burdened, uh, similar to the nation. But even with our owners, we have a lot of housing cost burden, uh, where 30% of our owners are housing cost burdened with a mortgage and 20% without a mortgage. And somebody says, well, how, do you, how are you housing cost burdened if you don't have a mortgage? Because you're still paying taxes and you're still paying utilities, and these are folks who are on fixed incomes. So the odds of, are more likely to be on fixed incomes. Um, so that's where you see that. And then housing cost burdens are acutely felt by folks in the uh, African-American and Hispanic communities. Uh, we see nearly half of all black households are housing cost burdened in Massachusetts, similar with uh, Latinx. Uh, new to the presentation now is uh, remote work. Massachusetts has the fifth highest percentage of remote workers in the nation. About a quarter of our workers are working remotely now. This is super exciting stuff from a nerd's perspective because uh, these data were not available until just a couple of months ago. So we were able to kind of dig in a little bit and better understand changes in remote work. This graphic here uh, shows um, how much that's changed. In, 19, in, uh, in, in 2019, 5% of Massachusetts was working remotely, as was in the US. Today, 24% compared to 18%. Uh, but there's big differences in who's working remotely. Uh, about 36% of folks with a graduate degree work remotely, 33% uh, of folks with a bachelor's degree, whereas only 9% of folks with a high school diploma are working remotely. Big differences by race as well as we look on the right, Asian and white are working above the state average remotely compared to other populations. Not surprisingly, the, uh, the patterns that we see are, are tied uh, closely to industry and occupation. Uh, professional and technical services, which I mentioned a bunch, 50% uh, of workers in that industry are working remotely. Similarly with uh, folks who are working in uh, management or uh, business ops. I'm going to move a little quickly because I know that we're short on time. Uh, this is a comparison of cities in Massachusetts and uh, what the remote work looks like in Cambridge. Um, it's 44% and Brockton just 13%. So uh, when we think about remote work, it's not an evenly distributed thing. And this map kind of touches on this where we uh, show the concentration of remote workers around the state and, and, and really uh, the affluent suburbs being a big part of that story. Uh, what about Metro South? What do we know about it? So we did, we did a couple ways of looking at this. What was the Nectar region in Plymouth? Uh, unemployment rate being low here, similar to the state, still str uh, behind on the job deficit. And then job growth is lagging uh, compared to, say, um, Massachusetts overall. Brockton's quite different. Uh, Brockton, uh, this is for the city. Unemployment rate is a bit elevated, 4.5%. Uh, 
um, significant population growth between 2010 and 2020. Um, and the job growth that's uh, a, a little bit behind where the state is right now, but importantly to some of the issues that uh, the mayor was mentioning, a, a, a huge immigrant population in the community, slightly elevated poverty rates, and a young population, which isn't surprising because immigrant populations tend to be uh, younger than the native born. Uh, and then uh, just for the region and what uh, industries are most important, uh, I'd highlight uh, the strengths in retail and education, but uh, really lagging on professional and business services. Uh, but uh, in the recovery period, uh, professional business services is actually a little bit bigger now than it was pre-pandemic, uh, so we're seeing growth there. And also, uh, the leisure and hospitality is actually bigger now than it was uh, pre-pandemic for the region. All right, um, I'm going to uh, just wrap it up right now. The big question on the economy is, um, you know, we, we're, we've recovered, but there's a lot of um, question marks right now, you know, as it relates to conflict globally, what's going on with inflation. I think Massachusetts is positioned well as far as states go uh, because we have a lot of sh uh, strengths uh, in terms of our workforce and so on. But from a public policy perspective, need to be very thoughtful in the coming years about how to maintain an adequately sized labor force uh, so that we can, uh, in, uh, that are enjoying the qualities of life uh, that are possible in Massachusetts. So with that, I'll stop. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Melnick. We only had two questions come forward. You answered one of them in your presentation. And uh, because of the great debate between Youngstown, Ohio, and Brockton, Massachusetts, <laughs> we want to give our mayor the last question. <laughs> and the, quest the question was, Brockton did so well, really well, under the uh, Baker Polito administration. You know, what do you think, Mr. Mayor? You could just come up and answer it, of our prospects under the Healy Driscoll administration. Again, thanks for being here. Thank you, Doctor. That was really informative. I truly appreciate that. Um, so under Charlie and, and Karen's administration, uh, there was a great relationship fostered by the late Mayor Bill Carpenter. Um, the LG, uh, Karen Polito, loved Brockton. And when I was elected, one of the first things I do was to reach out to the Baker Polito administration uh, and continue to foster that. Uh, one thing that uh, the LG uh, had asked to do before she departed, uh, she asked me if she could come to Brockton Bear and have a pint. Uh, she came and we had two. So uh, I will tell you under, uh, under Maura Healy and Kim Driscoll, Kim's a former mayor of Salem. When I was elected mayor, every Sunday night we would do a Zoom led by Marty Walsh and Kim Driscoll and Tommy McGee from Lynn. She's a friend of mine. And uh, it's exemplified by we spoke uh, three times since the fire at the hospital. So do I expect anything to change? No. I think it's going to be actually enhanced. Um, you know, politics aside, uh, it's a Democrat. I'm a Democrat, uh, but I have great friends that are other party. Uh, and at the end of the day, locally, it's nonpartisan, right? So it doesn't matter what you are, Democrat, Republican, unenrolled, independent in Brockton. Uh, but at the Beacon Hill, uh, you know, with, uh, with the Democrats controlling the House and the Senate and, uh, and the corner office, Brockton is ripe for beneficial endeavors. And what does that mean? A lot more c money coming back to the city of Champings. Uh, and I welcome it, I embrace it, I'm thankful for it. And, uh, you know, again, I just want to thank you, Chris, for your leadership. Uh, we got a lot more work to do. As my Nana used to say, roll up the sleeves and get the job done. So let's roll up the sleeves and get, it, get at it. Thank you. Thank you. It was either going to be a Powerball ticket or a pen. We voted on pen. Um, and we know the mayor has to go, so Mr. Mayor, if you have to go, that's fine. Don't just sit still for a couple of minutes. We have a couple of announcements, and we're going to give away some free stuff. So the next uh, event for the chamber is the eighth annual Multicultural Business Forum and SBA Community Navigator Expo, right here at Thorny Lee Golf Club, five to seven thirty on Thursday, March second. That program is sponsored in part by my bank, Northeastern Savings Bank, and features a diverse panel of four biz small business owners. Here's a couple of save the dates for you. We have a ribbon cutting at Reese's Marvelous Hats tomorrow, February 10th from four to five in Stoughton. And the all new Metro South Leadership Program will kick off on Wednesday, April 12th with a luncheon and economic development panel held right here. That seating is gonna be limited. The annual Small Business Entrepreneur of the Year Award and uh, Athena Award Program will be held in May and June respectively. And if you have nominations, please submit them now. 
and this Sunday is the Super Bowl and no one in New England cares. <laughs> All right. Now for some free stuff. Uh, each, each Good Day Metro South, we randomly select one company to be highlighted in an upcoming Action Report newsletter. And the Action Report business profile winner is Erica Hamilton, Brockton Visiting Nurse Association. Thank you, Erica. All right. We're giving away a Life is Good mug, and that goes to Tracy Valetti from Fisher College. And by the way, you should see Catherine in the back who has all the free stuff over there. And um, let's see, the Brax gift card goes to Rick Beckerman from Children Across America. And the bottle of wine with a gift card goes to Isabella Pardino from New York Life Insurance. Way to go, everyone. <laughs> all right. We want to thank all of our ambassadors, Rich Morgan Photography again, Brockton Community Access Channel, the Enterprise News, Chris Cooney and the Chamber staff members, our host, Thorny Lee, our sponsors and partners, especially Old Colony Elder Services and the Rotary Club of Brockton. And finally, thank you to all of our really amazing speakers, Dina, Nicole, Tina, uh, Mark, and uh, of course, our Mayor, Robert Sullivan and Sue, thank you for your participation as well. The last thing is you have on your table, in the middle of your table, uh, a centerpiece containing a Brockton Where Better Begins long sleeve t-shirt. Isn't that cool? That's great. That's pretty good. Now, here's how we're going to give it out. The person at each table, named Fred, <laughs> oh no, that was wrong. I'm sorry, I added that. The person at each table whose birthday is closest to today can take that prize home. All right. So, have a wonderful weekend, everyone. Be safe. <laughs>